Fire Emblem 3 sits at a really weird place when it comes to old Fire Emblem games. FE1 and FE2 are on the NES and as such carry a lot of archaic qualities. They don't have as many quality of life features as modern games, and they are very slow. This on its own is often enough to turn away would-be fans. And despite my love for everyone, I can't blame them. Dealing with the slow enemy phases is certainly an acquired taste. And if all you want is to experience a version of the campaign, both FE1 and FE Gaiden have remakes. Although both remakes do have pretty significant mechanical differences from the game that they're based on, to the point that I wouldn't say that they make the originals obsolete. There is a similar thing with FE3, but weirdly it kind of goes both ways. Its remake, Fire Emblem 12, is often touted as being purely mechanically superior to FE3 Book 2, which I personally disagree with. I'm not a huge fan of FE3 Book 2 or FE12, but I know enough about them to know that there are a lot of distinctions between the two games. FE12 has the infinite reclassing and significantly higher stats, whereas FE3 places a focus on dismounting, requiring you to change between which units you use on outdoor and indoor maps. This, combined with some of the other features of FE3, lead to Book 2 feeling very different from FE12, even if you don't use any of the new units that got added in the remake. But I'm not here to talk to you about games that I personally don't like. I want to try to sing the praises of Fire Emblem 3 Book 1, which finds itself in the awkward middle child stage, since it is a remake of the more archaic Fire Emblem 1, but it also later got remade as Fire Emblem 11. And hurting matters further are the fact that it is technically incomplete, as it is missing several chapters from the campaign of FE1 and FE11. The reason for this is likely limitations of the memory on the SNES cartridges, since Book 1 and Book 2 were both contained on the same cartridge. Still, this change has led to many people dismissing FE3 Book 1, because why would I play that? It's just an incomplete version of the story. If I want the old school version of the game, I'll play FE1, and if I want the new school version with reclassing and all the bells and whistles, I'll play FE11. Well, I'm here to answer the question of why would you play FE3 Book 1, because while I don't think it's the best game in the world, I do think it's pretty spectacular, and I think anyone who considers themselves a Fire Emblem enthusiast should at least consider checking it out. First off, I want to address anyone who hasn't played any of the old school games because they are worried that they will be clunky and unintuitive, like FE1 on the NSO. While FE3 is definitely less smooth to play than some modern Fire Emblem entries, I'd say it is a significant step up from both of the NES titles. Including basic quality of life like range checking, battle forecast, being able to check item and weapon stats, and weirdly, even some QOL that isn't present in any other game, including modern ones. For example, when checking the battle forecast, not only can you see your attack value, but you can also see the effective damage attack value. And this is something that I think would actually be quite nice in modern Fire Emblem. On the surface, it seems kind of unnecessary since we have the new simplified battle forecasts, but I think an effective damage value would be useful to check even outside of forecast. Frequently, I will check my unit's attack and defense values as well as enemies' attack and defense values in order to calculate whether certain moves are feasible or whether they're foolish. If, in addition to the attack value, it also listed the effective damage value, it would save me from having to do the math of multiplying weapon might in case I'm planning around using a unit who would take or deal effective damage. But to my mind, the coolest piece of quality of life that was added to FE3 that hasn't made a return since is the ability to visit houses as a free action. For those who aren't aware, there are two different types of buildings you can visit in Fire Emblem. There are houses, which just give you dialogue that gives you some sort of story flavor or a gameplay hint, and then there are villages that give you concrete rewards such as items or recruitable characters. However, because in most Fire Emblem games, visiting either of these consumes your entire turn, frequently players miss out on pieces of flavor simply due to the fact that they don't want to waste their action economy visiting houses. 
In FE3, you can visit a house and continue to take other actions, such as using healing stabs or attacking enemies, thus making it similar to the trade action, since it doesn't consume your entire turn. And speaking of trading, FE3 has infinite trading. This is the system, sometimes referred to the community as Thracia trading or Three Houses trading, wherein you can trade with any number of people as long as they are adjacent to you. Personally, I don't consider this feature to be quality of life, it's a conscious choice on whether to include or not include it, but I do think it's really cool, and FE3 originated the system. Now, trading is a little bit clunky in the FE3 menus, I'll give it that, but this was their first try at any sort of trade system, so it was always going to feel a little bit rusty. It's still a pretty significant upgrade over the gift item system from the NES. Hopefully, I've convinced you that FE3 has enough quality of life not to feel difficult to play, but the question is still worth asking. Just because something isn't difficult to play doesn't mean it's enjoyable. After all, FE7 has a lot of quality of life features, and you know how I feel about that game. So, what is it that makes FE3 Book 1 worth playing over either its predecessor or the remake? Well, technically its standout feature is the dismounting system, where mounted units have to get off of their horses, wyverns, or pegasuses in order to go inside. But I don't think Book 1 makes particularly good use of this. Since it borrows 90% of its maps from FE1 itself, they weren't designed with dismounting in mind, and as a result they don't really take advantage of the mechanics. In fact, in the game's first indoor map, Chapter 5, there are some treasures that are literally impossible to get without the warp staff because of the fact you don't have mounted units with the extra movement. No, instead my argument for why FE3 Book 1 is worth playing is it's both easy and short, and as a result it kind of just functions like a popcorn game. I've done two different playthroughs of Book 1. The first was a solo run that lasted around 8 hours and clearly wasn't how the game is meant to be designed. It was fun in its own right, but I don't necessarily think that that is how we would recommend others approach the game. The second, though, was an Iron Man. And I'm not typically a fan of Iron Man's, but FE3 Book 1 is an easy enough game that even someone like me could beat it in an Iron Man condition. I mean, I didn't, I lost in the final map, but I could is the point I'm making. Hey, casual Jacob here. That's a lie. She most certainly could not. I think part of why the Book 1 Iron Man was so fun is the game is really designed around it in multiple ways. First, the campaign features a lot of what would be referred to as replacement characters. If you lose out on Ogma or Nabarl, then you get handed Rad and Caesar, and if you lose them, you get handed Astrum and Samson. While FE11 would take this trend even further by giving you generic replaceables if your roster got too low, to my mind that takes something away from the drama of an Iron Man. Replacement units are there to help you stumble across the finish line, but at the same time, if you take too many heavy losses, you should be punished for it. To me, a core part of the Iron Man is attempting to minimize casualties. Of course, if you do too good of a job at this, then there's not really any tension. Playing safely removes the risk and therefore removes the drama. There's no unit deaths, nothing. And that's where the other potentially contentious aspect of FE3's difficulty comes in. The crit formula. In Fire Emblem 3, your crit is the weapon crit plus your skill, plus any support bonuses you have. In more modern games, skill only contributes half of its value to the critical hit rate, and so as a result, it's very rare for enemies to pull low percentage crits on all but the lowest luck of your units. But in FE3, because the crit formula is so generous, the majority of sword-wielding units will have low percentage crits on almost all of the members of your cast. The only way to negate crit is through your luck stat, or through support bonuses, which most characters don't have access to. Especially in the mid and late game, facing enemy heroes is always a roll of the dice, and it is oh so thrilling because most of the units in your army are utterly replaceable. It gives this fascinating push-pull, where you get attached to some of the goofier training projects because, if we're being honest, it's one of the easiest games in the series. But 
If you end up playing sloppy or just get unlucky with some crit rolls, then they can die and you have to pick up a new training project. But it's also not that hard to train up the training projects because again, easy game. Don't get me wrong, there are a couple of late game difficulty spikes, but Marth is pretty definitively the best unit in the game, so as long as you've got him alive, you've got a fighting chance. Marth dies to Medius? Yeah, he's a dodge tank though. He's a dodge tank. Never mind. Never mind. Lord Marth, you died so tragically. <laughs> now, even if you're not looking for an Iron Man run, I think FE3 can be a rewarding experience. Playing through a toned down version of Marth's campaign as essentially a popcorn game is quite an enjoyable experience to anyone who's super into Fire Emblem. And I would argue the fact that it is of a lower difficulty can push you to not take advantage of some of the broken tools handed to you. Because FE11 uses high stats as its primary form of difficulty, it incentivizes you to make use of some of the more broken tools in the game. Infinite Range Warp, Forges, the Ballista class, all of these are tools that FE11 gives you to fight against the rather unfair hordes of enemies. And you kind of need to use these unfair tools to fight against the unfair enemies. Yes, I know it is possible to beat the game on Hard 5 Forgeless or Warpless or Ballista List or all three, but if we're being realistic, that is probably a less fun experience. On the other hand, in my Iron Man of FE3, I banned the Warp Staff. Because Book 1's primary form of difficulty is specific strong enemies, as opposed to every enemy being strong, as well as the low percentage crit chance, it was much more feasible to come up with strategies that don't involve using my channel icon's starting inventory. But I know there will be some people in the audience who are unconvinced because of the one common argument against FE3 Book 1. It's an incomplete experience. It's missing maps from the original game, and therefore it is objectively worse than both FE1 and FE11. In total, FE3 Book 1 cut five chapters from FE1. They are Chapter 4, Battle in the Lea, Chapter 9, The Pyrathi Dragon, Chapter 13, The Wooden Cavalry, Chapter 18, The Sable Order, and Chapter 21, The Clash in Macedon. Additionally, Chapter 23, The Dark Pontifex, has been completely remade as its own original map. These five maps are kind of the definition of filler. Battle in the Lea is just a wide open field that doesn't really have any story or gameplay significance. You cross a river, seize a castle, bada bing, bada boom. The Pyrathi Dragon is a map that I personally really like, but story wise, it doesn't really fulfill anything. From a gameplay perspective, it is interesting to split your forces, but I don't think you miss out on too much by skipping it. The Wooden Cavalry is probably the worst map in both FE11 and FE1, and honestly, I'm glad they cut it. Running down a hallway of ballistas isn't fun in Shadow Dragon, and in FE1, it's just a bunch of armored archers. Not very interesting either. The Sable Order is literally just a bridge that you charge down and fight cavalry. Again, not an interesting map. And Clash in Macedon is a wide open field that you fight a couple of wyverns and paladins on. Again, it's not an interesting map, and the fact that it comes so late in the game makes it feel extra egregious. Personally, I think the end game of Fire Emblem should be a constant escalation. We just finished fighting Camus, and then we have boring ass map before we have Clash in Macedon. Overall, I do not think that the missing maps are a downside. There's only one that I actively missed during my playthrough, and there were two that I was glad to not engage with. There are also several characters who get cut out, but they are similarly unimpactful. Riss is an early game healer, but he's replaced with a vulnerary that does basically the same thing. Daros and Roger are fun meme characters, but ultimately I don't think they're a huge deal for the meta. 
And Jake and Beck are incredible in Shadow Dragon, but terrible in FE1, and kind of unnecessary with the difficulty that we have in FE3. Oh yeah, Goto also isn't in this game, but FE1 Goto is pretty trash, so he's kind of forgettable. I don't really care that he's missing either. From a certain perspective, I can understand why people harp on the missing content of FE3 Book 1 as a negative. Anytime that you are missing something, it feels like it's been taken away from you, especially in a remake. But I understand the reason that they've removed it from a technical perspective, and from a gameplay perspective, I don't actually miss the boring filler chapters or the boring filler characters. And look, if you have posters of Daros all over the walls of your bedroom, and as a result, you refuse to engage with FE3 Book 1 on a moral stance, then that's your choice. You know, have fun with your husbando. But if the reason you were avoiding FE3 Book 1 was because there was missing content and you thought that would make it worse, I hope that this counter-argument at least makes some amount of sense. And maybe it's enough to convince you to try the game out? It's probably my favorite version of Marth's first outing. But you know who else are probably my favorites? My patrons! So, thank you to Michael Krause, Len, Gameboo, Carosa, Firent, Smaz Ruby, Saxon, Reflect, Marin McLean, Calamity Callie, Queen Elizam, Adele, They Thom, Andu, Jamie Collins, Mean Jojo, Thick Molder, Daniel Kalaskis, Arvis, Bell Wenska, Die Psych, Joss Jingle, Tailored Muffin, George Granville the 7th PM, SUP, Caius Cole, Gabe the Green, Control Tejas, Joanna the Wrenchwitz, Ginger, and especially my Jagans, Autumn Kelsey, and Julia Kyoto. If you are interested in supporting the channel, there is a link below to my Patreon, but please only donate if you can comfortably afford to do so. I don't want anyone going broke over Fire Emblem content. Free ways to support the channel are liking, subscribing, commenting, all the YouTube stuff, but regardless of what you choose to do, I hope you have a wonderful day. Stay safe, gamers.